Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSurge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. So uh, this is um, just a very brief introduction to the principles of PSM. Um, by no means um, am I uh, able to give you a detailed um, granular advice on how to do PSM. Uh, it's really important to engage with statisticians um, who understand the, the actual calculations and the modeling of PSM. This is just, um, the aim is to give us an idea of what to look for in a paper that uses PSM, what the potential applications are, and what the advantages and limitations of PSM are. Okay, so firstly, I think we should start off talking about what are observational studies, because this is where we use propensity score matching. So these are studies uh, which can be clinical or otherwise that do not intervene in the natural history of a process of disease. So we've talked about observational studies before in one of our previous lectures, and essentially they evaluate relationships between variables. And we, when we say variables in observational studies, we refer to variables which come under the category of exposure and variables that come under the category of endpoints or outcomes. For example, if you're looking at a study evaluating the relationship between smoking and lung cancer, smoking is a risk factor or an exposure and lung cancer, which is essentially you know, an occurrence of disease is the endpoint. Similarly, if you're looking at studies evaluating uh, relationships between specific treatments and clinical outcomes, the treatment becomes the exposure and the clinical outcomes, which can be um, death or recurrent disease uh, or success of treatment, that will become the endpoint. And we'll just focus on uh, an example where we talk about a treatment and a clinical outcome. Now, the big problem with observational studies is bias. There are all sorts of different types of biases that occur in observational studies. And uh, the bias that we're gonna talk about today is bias due to the presence of confounding variables or variables that impact on both the exposure and the endpoint, okay? Now, the ideal solution for this is to simply do a randomized controlled trial. And, uh, and, but you know that for a variety of reasons, randomized controlled trials are sometimes not possible, not appropriate, sometimes inadequate, and sometimes not necessary. So uh, uh, one solution then to address the bias due to confounders is to use um, statistical methods in these observation studies and try and minimize the bias due to the confounders. Okay, let's talk about an example. And me being a thyroid surgeon, I'll give you an example of thyroid cancer. Now, if you look at um, clinically node negative thyroid cancer, there is a debate, there has been a debate on what the optimal approach would be. Now, um, there will be some people that would say that a total thyroidectomy would be sufficient. And there will be others that would say that in addition to a total thyroidectomy, you do a prophylactic central link dissection to try and reduce recurrence of cancer in the neck, to try and reduce local regional recurrence. So let's take this as an example and uh, uh, assume that there aren't any randomized controlled trials that uh, address this problem and that you're planning to, or you have access to a large registry that, of thyroid cancer patients who've undergone surgery and you would like to evaluate outcomes after total thyroidectomy and, or total thyroidectomy and central link dissection in clinically node negative, um, which is N not thyroid cancer. Okay, so you've got a, a large population of thyroid cancer patients in a big database that you've got access to. Let's say the ones in blue here are the patients who've had more aggressive surgery. I'll refer to that as having had neck dissection. And the ones in green have just had a total thyroidectomy, okay? And in this particular example, 
we've got two variables that potentially can affect the choice of treatment, which is, um, like I say, either just a thyroidectomy or um, alternatively a neck dissection as well. And also these variables can directly influence the outcome. So one of the variables is gender. So you, you have men and women, and they have slightly different impacts on the outcome. And then you've got the size of the tumor or the T stage. So um, someone said this should be T1, T2. The T1, T2 are good prognosis tumors. And the clinicians might often choose to just do a total thyroidectomy, whereas if it's T3 and above, then the, a number of clinicians might add a central neck dissection, even if there are no obvious clinically enlarged or radiologically enlarged lymph nodes. Okay, so uh, these are just two examples. And, and as you would imagine, there could be lots of other factors that can influence your outcome and influence the choice of treatment. And these would be considered confounding variables and that can uh, introduce bias in uh, observational studies. Right, uh, let's just assume that you've looked at outcomes overall in these two groups of patients and you find that the outcomes are generally equal. In other words, the recurrence rates are um, the same. So would you then say that these groups are genuinely equivalent or would you say they could be biased due to the variables that you've discussed and many others that might have influenced the choice of treatment? And then you've got to keep in mind again that this is obviously not a randomized controlled trial. So patients haven't been randomly allocated to treatment. There would have been lots of discussions about their risk factors, prognostic factors, that would have been taken into account and the patient and the surgeon would have then made a choice based on these risk factors as to whether to go with total thyroidectomy or more extensive surgery, okay? And these factors could be patient-related, tumor-related, related to the surgeon or the hospital and related to geography or the center where there might be specific protocols on the extent of surgery and also on additional treatment, additional and adjunctive treatment like radioiodine and the dose of radioiodine and so on. Right, so this bias um, traditionally um, has been addressed by what we call regression analysis and multivariable analysis. We're not going into the details of this. And um, the downside to regression or multivariable analysis are several, and we'll discuss this a bit later on, but you could potentially do regression analysis. You could also say that you would match patients in the two arms, the node dissection arm and the thyroidectomy only arm, factor by factor. And, but then it becomes really complicated. If you, if you have a dozen different factors or confounding variables, then the matching process becomes almost impossible. So the solution then is to think about doing propensity score matching, or some people call it propensity score analysis. Now, um, the, just to look at this phrase in a bit more detail, um, when you talk about propensity score matching, what does the word propensity score means? That simply means the probability of getting um, allocated to or, or having had the intervention of interest. And in this case, let's say the intervention of interest is the neck dissection along with thyroidectomy. So that will be the pro propensity score. And then the matching, and propensity score matching is where you try and balance out the various confounding factors in the two um, arms. And once you balance them out, you compute the treatment effect in these balanced groups. So that is in brief what PSM is. Now let's go through this um, step by step. So the first step really is to select the confounding variables. So you're looking for variables and that are linked to both the choice of treatment and the outcome recurrence in this case. So uh, like I said, there could be a number of different uh, confounding variables that could be patient related, tumor related and uh, um, provider related. They could be gender, tumor size, whether the, the tumor is detected symptomatically or incidentally, age of the patient and so on and so forth. Once you've decided on these confounding variables, you then have to calculate this PS score, propensity score, for each patient 
which is essentially the probability of receive, uh, receiving the, the treatment of interest given all of these confounders. Now, this is usually done using logistic regression, so going back to regression, but this is uh, where you predict what treatment the patient had, uh, and then you're not predicting the outcome as you would do in the typical regression analysis. Occasionally, some, some other complicated methods can be used, but we won't go into the details of those. The next step is to use the um, propensity scores to get similar patients in the total thyroidectomy arm and the node dissection arm. And the way this is done typically, or in most surgical research papers, is by matching. That is the commonest approach, although there are some other uh, methods that have certain specific advantages in some specific settings. Uh, and again, we're not going to go into the details. Uh, so we'll just um, talk about matching as the commonest way of getting the two groups balanced. You then check if the groups are balanced. When we say balanced, we mean with regards to the propensity score and with regards to, do the, to uh, the baseline characteristics like gender and tumor size and, and the age and so on. Finally, you estimate the treatment effects by comparing these well-balanced groups, right? And then and that is the, uh, that's it, you're done. You've done the propensity score matching. Now, like we've discussed in this paper, matching may not be possible for many participants, which means that the two groups may actually represent slightly different cohorts of patients, which is probably why they had slightly different treatments offered to them. And to get reasonable numbers matched, as we've seen in the paper just now, we'll need really large sample sizes. But if you don't have large sample sizes, then the power of your analysis is reduced, or the precision of the effect that you estimate to be due to treatment is always reduced. Now, like I said before, there are some other balancing methods apart from matching that might um, help in certain situations whereby you include the entire data set and minimize loss of participants. But this is a big limitation of propensity score matching. The other limitation is that you could still have bias due to confounding variables because you might have just adjusted for some confounding variables, but not all because you don't have data on other, other confounding variables. And there might be some unknown or latent variables. And effectively, if you really want to balance out all confounding variables, the only way this can be truly done is by random allocation, in other words, a randomized control trial. And you might be wondering uh, that you may have done some regression analysis as part of your um, clinical res research, and why not just stick to what we know? Why do we have to do PSM? There are a few reasons. So I'll try and go through a few. So the first thing to think about is, what's the idea behind this analysis? If you're doing regression analysis, the idea is to enable you to assess treatment effect conditional on these confounding variables, okay? And that's slightly different to PSM, where the idea is to enable assessment of the effect in comparable groups. So uh, you make the groups comparable, and then you look at the treatment effect. In some ways, it's a bit like uh, a randomized control trial. So the next thing is the implementation. So if you're doing regression analysis, it's usually done at the end of the study, you collect all the data, and then you sit down to analyze the data and you look at all these confounding variables and you do regression analysis uh, to look at the effect of these confounders on your outcome. And these variables can be modified or influenced by the researcher. You might be tempted to add certain variables, remove certain variables, play around with the data. And therefore the process is a little bit subjective and less transparent. However, in PSM, there are two steps, a little bit like the randomized control trials. Like in randomized control trials, your participants are randomly allocated to one of two groups. In PSM, there's a design stage where you are creating treatment and matched control groups. And you are then checking if they're balanced um, and similar. And then at a later stage, you're gonna do the analysis. So in many ways, it is less susceptible to uh, being influenced by the researcher. And the next difference is that 
uh, in regression, and the analysis itself, it, uh, which is done late, it doesn't really allow you to compare the two groups. Whereas in PSM, like I've explained, it allows you to see the two groups are balanced or similar. Now, if there are big differences in the two groups, as there often can be, because patients have undergone one treatment or the other in an observational setting, probably for good reason. And if there are huge differences in these two groups, the regression will simply calculate um, what you want to calculate, regardless of the big differences between the two groups. Whereas with PSM, it'll limit your ability to make inferences. It will show you that the groups aren't getting balanced, regardless of um, how hard you tried. And therefore, it'll limit your ability to make big inferences um, about your analysis. When it comes to confounders, which are the variables like gender and age and tumor size that I mentioned before, with regression, the number of confounders you can analyze in your regression model is restricted by the number of events or endpoints. And the rule of thumb is that um, you can include one confounder for every 10 events. However, in PSM, you do not have that kind of restriction. Again, with regression, uh, if the events are rare, then there's less information available to, uh, for you to estimate the association between the dependent and the independent variables. While in PSM, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the rarity of the events is not a major issue. And finally, in regression, the variables, uh, you assume that they are uh, linearly related. Whereas in PSM, you make no such assumption. And that's a, another advantage considered by the statisticians. So essentially, what we need to know is that PSM does have certain distinct advantages. But it's a complicated thing to do. A lot, most of us aren't necessarily equipped and, or qualified to do these analysis. We need to sit down with the statisticians, have a, a good discussion with, uh, with them, ensure that they understand the clinical uh, implications and the value of the confounding variables and, and then come to an agreement on what confounders to choose and what kind of um, uh, matching you should do and how you interpret the results and so on. Right, so what have you learned? So I hope I've uh, uh, emphasized that PSM or propensity score matching is one way to adjust for variables that can influence both the choice of treatment and the outcome, and how it helps to minimize what I call confounding bias in an observational study. Now, there the are lots of uh, advantages, like I've uh, explained, compared to traditional regression analysis. The methodology, however, is quite complicated. And at every step of the PS modeling, and there are a number of different alternatives in which you can do the modeling and these approaches are evolving. So um, it's really important to get help. So there are a couple of um, fairly easy to read papers um, that, that you can see on the screen um, that is quite useful for non-statisticians, uh, clinicians and researchers like us. That might be useful for you to have a look. And there are also some uh, reporting guidelines that if at all you do um, a project and you do PS modeling, then you could um, look this paper up and decide on how you're going to report your analysis. Thank you. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.